Welcome to Money Matters. I am Emily Johnson, Certified Financial Planner and Managing Director of Polaris Capital Advisors, and I am joined, as always, by the one and only and amazing David Kroll of Mortgage Network, and we are here to discuss all things where your money matters. So we're going to lead off this week with just a little summary of what's gone on in the uh, equity markets, which has been continuous, new, and it'll by it'll bit more highs. So uh, we hit Dow is it 22,000 and then we went 22,002, 22,036 and you know so it's just been mm -hmm. been uh, one little incremental step after another. Um, most sectors are participating. Uh, financials and energy are still sort of laggards by and large and the you know other sectors industrials, uh, technology etc have continued to to sort of you know edge edge on upwards but by and large this the, the market as a whole the S&P the Dow are all edging up it's interesting one one little tidbit is that the Dow and the and the S&P are not moving in lockstep because of the um, the large number or the large concentration of um, of some of the larger companies in the Dow and so that's actually been interesting of how those two if you happen to have um, indexes in your 401ks or any of your other investments, you won't see the Dow and the S&P moving in lockstep, and, and that's actually why. It's because of how they're calculated. So even though when people talk in broad terms about the equity markets going up or the Dow or the S&P going up, they're not really moving in lockstep. Um, the NASDAQ, of course, never really moves in lockstep with them. Typically, it goes up around, you know, approximately um, at the same time, but because it's made up primarily of technology companies and smaller uh, smaller companies, it doesn't always move the same way either. But the Dow and the S and P, I think most uh, most laymen assume that they do, and it really it hasn't been. So that's sort of an interesting little. What What are you seeing as forecasts for uh, the toppiness of the market? Is uh, is twenty two thousand higher than you would have expected? Is that likely to be a ceiling of some sort? What, what are you hearing? Well, so certainly there, there's opinions that, to I, that there's extent. Opinions there's opinions, opinions all over sides. the place. So, yeah. so I, I hear that, of course. There are certainly analysts that are, that are predicting that we're sort of you know, at that toppy range, that perhaps we're overbought. However, a few big factors to consider. One, of course, is demographics. I mean, you have, there's a lot of money that's still sitting in the markets and sitting on the sidelines because you have baby boomers that need yield and they need growth. And so you're not going to see that change anytime in the, in the near future because most of those individuals either still have funds in their IRAs, 401ks, they're drawing income, and there's also still a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines looking for a place to go. So that, that's number one. Number two is pension funds like CalPERS, like um, the South Carolina Retirement Fund, teachers, uh, municipalities, et cetera, they all have um, guaranteed rates of return that they have, well, I shouldn't say this, they have assumed rates of return that they have to hit in order to pay out their pension payments in the future. So mm -hmm. if you're a teacher and you're expecting a pension of $3,000 a month five years from now, and that's going to go from now until kingdom come, South Carolina Retirement Fund has to make sure that those monies are there to pay you out that $3,000 a month whenever it is that that begins. In order to hit that mark for the thousands and thousands of people that they have to hit that mark for, they are assuming that they are going to gain about 65 to 7% a year. It actually just recently, they just lowered from, on average, they've lowered from 7 to 6.5% because interest rates are where they are. Typically, those pension funds, just like insurance companies, are investing in really low-risk um, assets like treasuries, like other you know high um, high quality corporate bonds, but you just can't get that six and a half yield now. One of one of the things that that I've been not only hearing but reading and and seeing take mm -hmm. place is that the search for yield, which Emily has just been explaining, you know so clearly. Uh -huh. That's <laughs> no, that search for yield um, has become intense, and since it's not available in the bond markets. Uh, a higher and higher percentage of, of both personal assets, uh, baby boomer personal assets, and even pension funds, uh, uh, the percentage that are in equities has been increasing. It has to. Because they got to in order to get yield from growth. Right. So that's, a, that's always been a, uh, an odd equation. The, the, the yield can come in its simplest form from the yield on a bond, which is an interest rate, so you know in advance what the yield right. is. Right, and as long but as there are pension funds that still have to pay out, which at this point we still have, even though pensions by and large have, have gone by the wayside for government employees, municipal employees, teachers, not-for-profits, they have it. There's still, that's a huge, huge, huge part of the market, but, and they have to invest. But when you invest in equities at a point A and then sell those equities at a point B, 
three years later and you've had a gr an enormous gain, then what happens is you do a backward calculation to determine what your effective yield over that period has been. Correct. And that's, 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 that's not a game. That's basically becoming more and more of a strategy because the yield can't be found anywhere else. Right. So hoped for growth equals yield. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the arguments for the fact that, they, that, they, that the market that explains, as you explained, why the, uh, the investment in the market still right. is robust. So, you, you know, yeah. we're, we just went through an earnings, yet another um, earn, earnings season, earnings report, and earnings, of course, have been good. Profits, by and large, have been good. So everything there has been good. Nothing has been um, off the charts. Oh, my gosh, you know, I think that we're, you know, moving into a new echelon here of earnings. But just, again, steady eddy growth. So that buoys the idea that, that there, we are not, you know, at the very top just yet. But really what's underlying most of the, of the participation or most of the growth is the necessity of participation in the markets. And you're seeing more and more trends towards indexes, more and more trends towards ETFs and sectors. You're seeing that um, from retail investors. You're seeing it in institutional uh, investors. BlackRock actually got rid of or is getting rid of uh, their, their active mutual funds and sticking just with, um, with the iShares, which, which is ETFs. It's just really interesting that, that that's it's how people that are participating. interesting that BlackRock would do that. Yes. I it mean, says a lot for Wall Street, actually. It's sort yeah. of, I'm sure it's scary for a few firms up there <laughs> and employees. <laughs> and, and employees, because uh, uh, BlackRock's action uh, is reputed to have cost something like 1,500 jobs because it's a massive fund. Active investing is on the out. Uh, the ETFs. Well, and the other the other thing that's that's impacting the financial services, of course, is the is the uh, Department of Labor rule, this new fiduciary rule, mm -hmm. which is so abstract that it's really hard to even understand. I mean, just the concept that all advisors should act in the best interest of their clients, that makes sense in general. The way that they're trying to actually implement it is what's really gray. So I know that, you know, RIAs, like, like firms like mine, have always been subject to it. Um, Commission-based brokers, which typical brokers, have not been subject to it, but a lot of them are what's called dual licensed anyway. Regardless, what it means is these large financial firms now have huge, huge legal bills that they are now um, assuming are going to be coming down the pike because they've had to implement a compliance measure that they truly don't know what they're supposed to be doing, like how they're supposed to be tracking it. You know, it's, it's like... There, you know, there are statutes and then there are the regulatory reforms that follow in the wake of a statute. And so you won't know until there's actually there lawsuits case, and precedents. And then precedence. there's cases. Right. And, and so, cases. Until we, so they're basically the big financial firms, big insurance companies, any, you know, big, any of the big financial firms are right now waiting to see when the lawsuits are coming down the pike and how, how they are is how it adjudicated. Yes. And then yeah. once that happens and they have a precedent, then they can actually implement what needs to be implemented. It's we, just we've, backwards. But. We've seen the same in our industry. Right. Uh, no um, surprise. Banks are, uh, well, we're a mortgage bank. We're a $3 billion mortgage bank that does only mortgages and is uh, a chartered, licensed mortgage bank. Uh, the, the big banks, uh, Wells Fargo and Bank of America and so forth, are exempted from most of the uh, regulation that, that we was imposed on us in mm -hmm. 2009, 2010. It's not fair. It's just <laughs> not fair. Uh, the good news <laughs> is that slowly but surely the big banks have are getting it. Uh, have come <laughs> under the same regulations. Right, which they should have in the beginning. And embedded in uh, in our world is the same uh, the same concept that's that's in uh, Emily's uh, financial advisory world, just as just as uh, she and her peers must invest for the, what's the quote? For the benefit. Be the best interest of the client. The best interest right. of the client, which. We've always called it the prudent man rule. We were always subject to the prudent man rule. If you have a CFP, you're subject to that. And, so. and the, the similar rule in, in the case of mortgage bankers is we must not lend in such a fashion that the borrower cannot repay. In the pos putting it positively, we must only lend uh, uh, such that the borrower will be able to make the payments and repay the loan. Uh, it's a fairly obvious structure, right. but uh, every time I lend uh, a mortgage, if, if the fella or the girl uh, loses their job a week after we close the mortgage, 
Well, we're subject to the same thing. If you know, if we put together well, financial did I plans make a that mistake assume right. because of someone's future unfortunate occurrence. Right. What if they got divorced? So the income in the household is half what it used to be. Mm -hmm. Have I have I uh, made a mistake in lending the money in the first place? And, of course not. Well, and you know, and you stress test everything. I'm sure that there must be some equivalent in in the mortgage industry. We stress test the plans that we put together and do, you know, it's called a Monte Carlo analysis, but it's really just a stress test. If you take the plan, you put it through a million iterations and see what's the likelihood, the percentage likelihood that this is actually going to be where we end up. We try to aim for at least over 80% in something like that. And, and yet, you still never know. I mean, you do the best that you can based on the historical performance, but you still have, you have the human component of it that might be Which like exactly huge. what you just talked about. It could be huge. divorce, could be medical issues, whatever, that, that can throw monkey wrenches. So you do what you can to ensure around it that's that's a, that's the best we can do. That's the best we can yes. do. Yes. Okay, well we'll be back in just a minute with more money matters. I think we are going to dig into your credit and how to keep it strong uh, so you can take advantage of this awesome market that we're in. Okay? We'll be right back.